this validates uh, that M, that you know uh, Michael Jordan is the greatest. And for me, I didn't take that. I love the docu series. I'm from Chicago, or at least the suburbs of Chicago. I enjoyed his competitiveness. I enjoyed uh, everything that he brought to the table. But I don't think this validated to me the greatness of Michael Jordan. It's without a shadow of a doubt. He's the greatest competitor. It's without a shadow of a doubt. I even give him the title of the GOAT. But his strategy that he went about winning to me just won't work in today's game. I think when you look at it holistically, I think you have to say, would that work today? And the answer is no. When I evaluate greatness, I look at overall impact, his impact on his team members, his impact on the community. I think I was saddened to hear that none of his teammates called him friend, not even Scottie Pippen. You know, I think we assume that that relationship is deeper than what it is. But all I saw was just a very driven person who basically uh, put everything on his back and had this severe tunnel vision uh, to the point that he was able to achieve this great victory at all costs. And I do mean all costs. That is my takeaway from the documentary. If you want to be great, you can do it, but you're going to basically destroy everything in your path in doing it. What are your thoughts? I think you have uh, some small points, but none, nothing major. Okay. Um, I'm going to address it backwards. Um, first of all, you, you basically saying that he was an amazing player and he is the GOAT, but because he's not liked in some areas about the people around him, that you're going to hold that against him because of the path that he took to get to his destiny. I think. Yeah. Oh, so this is just completely comparing him to LeBron James, or are we saying that he's not the greatest of all time? I think he's the greatest champion of all time. I think as a basketball fan, he is something to admire. Uh, it's just there's this. I think there's a disconnect because when I see when I see MJ, I'm like, man, all that ability. But who really knows MJ? You know what I'm saying? Like, who calls MJ and be like, hey, what's up? You want to go to IHOP? I just, to me, there's a human disconnect. When it comes to the court, he could probably average 100 points in today's game. But is that the type of person, is that the type of athlete that we need or that we want? Well, by far, he and Muhammad Ali are the most influential athletes of all time, by far, as far as what they have, they imprint on the sports sports culture. So I, as far as like what type of person he is that we're like, that you're kind of judging him because basically LeBron James has a school. I think that's not really cool in the argument of who's the greatest of all time. And I'm a Kobe guy for the record. I'm not a LeBron hater. Yeah. And because of the last dance documentary, I just had to say, if I had to choose one, it would definitely be Michael over LeBron because I think you kind of proven my point for me that LeBron actually cares about what people think more than Michael Jordan ever cared. So are we going to um, uh, Michael Jordan loses points? It's because he didn't uh, take Steve Kerr to 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 certain places with him. I, I, I don't see it that way. I don't say that Michael Jordan loses points. I think the overall effectiveness of MJ's strategy um, is twofold. He only knows one mode, and that's winning. That's great. That's what you want, right? But organizationally, that does not work. You know, like, if you had – it's just like this. If you had this great whatever, psalmist, preacher, whatever, that is – multi-hyphenated, just oozing with talent, but they stink when it comes to getting along with people. They are toxic. You will destroy an organization, right? So it's like he gets all this, but look what it cost him. You cannot tell me that if there was just a little bit of difference, just a little bit of, of just you know a more smooth approach, Jerry Reinsdorf would have did everything in his power to bring back MJ. There's a reason why they did not fight harder. I, t I totally disagree. And Cody, being who you are and as intellectual as you are, the, the mystique of Michael Jordan 
got to the powers that be because of different reasons that had that went beyond his um, attitude. I'm sure it had something to do with his skin as well. And what I loved about Michael Jordan, and, and again, I'm not a Michael Jordan fanatic, but what I loved about him is he did it with a passion that I'm going to get the job done by any means necessary. LeBron, on the other hand, has been unsuccessful more than successful when he had come down to championships. And I think that if he would have had more of a Michael Jordan attitude, especially against Dallas, that we can be having a different conversation. Look, Dallas is a debacle. There's no excuse for Dallas. I said Dallas, LeBron's marker to me is a failure. It's Dallas because Dirk Nowitzki should not have won the championship. But you're a Kobe guy. God rest his soul. I love Kobe Bryant. I love Kobe Bryant. But who did Dallas beat to get there? Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, they swept the Lakers that year. That was the Andrew Bynum to the to the ribs on uh, uh, the little point guard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so you it's not that yeah, LeBron dropped the ball. Okay, okay. And I think all great yeah. Yeah. dropped the ball at some point. But his dropping the ball was more because of lack of death with the team. Oh my yeah, it, it wasn't because look, 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 their starting point guard was Carlos Arroyo. They really had no bench play. Dallas comes out and literally has 12 deep on their roster. Seven of them are three-point specialists. And literally, they got out-coached. They got outplayed. And, I, you know, I just can't take Dallas as the black stain. I think Dallas was just a, a learning moment uh, for me. And considering that they did it in their first year, that's hard to come together to win a championship in the first year. Mr. Kelly. Yeah. LeBron did not want the ball. He did. So whatever, whatever you want to say about Kobe Bean, let he me did. show you. Okay. All right. Whatever you want to say about Kobe Bean or Michael Jordan, you've never seen them not want the ball. Okay. So when we come down to talking about greatness, how in the world, and as great as LeBron is, how in the world are we even comparing him to, to Michael and, and, and how did y'all skip Kobe when this man did not want the ball, Cody? Come on, family. I, I don't think we're skipping Kobe. I love Kobe. I think people do him a disjustice by skipping over him. But the problem with – I get the lower Marion jersey. I get it. Look, I rooted for Kobe. Here's – Kobe is so good, we didn't realize how, how good he was. The problem with the Kobe Bryant comparison is that when you saw him – you saw Mike. When you see LeBron, you don't see anybody like him. He's so different. He's built different. He looks different. He is literally a 6'9", 280-pound juggernaut out there that can move like a gazelle. Agreed. And when you see that, you're just captivated by his aura. The problem is with Kobe is that because Kobe was so great, he had to overcome two shadows. The first shadow is Shaq. You can't ignore the Shaq effect. The second shadow is MJ. You can't ignore the mannerisms, the talk, the the vocal registry. I mean, so much of Kobe Bryant is MJ. And that's not a bad thing. I love Kobe Bryant. If Kobe was in the game today, he would average 35 without a shadow of a doubt, if not 40. But just... I think what makes Kobe better, and when we look back in hindsight, is the progression of who he was. We saw Kobe grow up. We saw him develop. We saw mistakes. We saw maturation, right? We saw a completed product. MJ literally is linear from 84, 85 to 2003 with the Wizards. That's just the same person, you know, so... Every great story needs dynamic appeal. Every great story needs the ups and downs. MJ, unfortunately, this is it. The ups and downs is his relationships with teammates and opponents. Just like I think Isaiah Thomas gets unnecessary flack. I think Isaiah Thomas is one of Chicago's greatest, uh, if not the greatest. He won two rings. Behind him, to me, is Derrick Rose. We're talking about true Chicagoans, right? So it's hard for me to digest what Michael put out, 
he's without a shadow of a doubt. I wouldn't, there's nobody on earth that can touch him from a basketball standpoint. Okay. When you think about would it work today, the answer is no. There's no deny about it. There's okay. nobody who would team up with that. Can I ask you a question? Sure. If Michael Jordan was on that Heat team instead of LeBron, who would have won that series? If MJ was on the on the on the Heat team in 2011, yes. Be honest. Be, <laughs> Come on. If MJ was on the Heat team in 2011, come uh, on, Max Kellerman, you can lose a debate every now and then. Chris Bosh would have had a migraine. That's how it would have worked. Oh, I'm just trying to tell you that that he would have won. <laughs> he would have won. He, that he, he would have won. won. So what I'm telling you is that sometimes greatness comes with a price, and yeah. because. Uh, Michael paid the price for it, and 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 we talking like LeBron, just is the greatest teammate of all time. I mean, you know, everybody's not perfect. People have their flaws, but he makes people better. He makes people better. There's not a teammate. Wait, 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 wait. wait. He, made, he, made, he makes who better? He made Bosh better. Wait, wait, what? Do you know Chris Bosh was already the All Star? He was, but he became a better player with okay. LeBron. You do know he made, Wade was already an all-star, right? Mike Miller better. He made Carlos Boozer better. He made Daniel Gibson better. Daniel okay. Gibson. Oh, okay. so, hold, 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 hold on. so you mean to tell me that Jordan didn't make Kerr better? He didn't make Cliff Lippensting better? Cody, your argument. Come on, your argument when it comes down to making better just because LeBron is a better passer doesn't make that he makes everybody better because his game is more like Magic Johnson. LeBron makes organizations better. LeBron is a CEO in a player's body, and he's always pushing the envelope to create a better structural efficiency. I mean, are we are we talking politics now? Am I supposed to go Joe Bi Joe Biden on you? It's because no, we were talking no, about we don't need to vote to Joe. If you don't vote for Joe, you're not black. <laughs> we don't need, <laughs> we don't need Joe. Is that what I'm I'm he overheard black people talking. He's like, I'm gonna try this one. And just hey, Joe, and just hey, Joe. hey, he messed up on that one. <laughs> yes, he did. But that's a good segue. Let's shift focus here. Okay, let's shift focus. Like I said, I agree. MJ still the goat. But if I had to pick somebody to start my franchise, I'm picking LeBron. Let's shift focus to something more serious. We are in the I would say latter stages of COVID 19. Has the church done? enough when it comes to COVID-19? Has it done enough? I've seen a lot of services. I've seen a lot of programs and conferences, but really is that what's needed, right? When you think about 14.7% U.S. national unemployment, you think about 30 million Americans unemployed and or furloughed. You think about a third of them will not return from their furloughed status. You think about the new normal that's going to happen because organizations now have a case study to look at future workforce planning strategies going forward. Has the church done enough? Absolutely not. But it, but it's not because of the pandemic. It was because we wasn't doing enough before the pandemic. So we're not going to be able to tap into better while we end famine when we do not have vision even when it wasn't a famine. So one of the things that I'm very careful about when we use the word church, it's a difference between church and church as. Right. So the church is always going to be good scripturally, but we as church as that we are linked into the body of Christ. Like I'm linked in here. Right. Many times we drop the ball is because we do not stay true to our identity. Like, I know what my church is. I know what our identity is. I know what we do well. I know what we was called for. And I know our weaknesses. But you'll never hear me proclaim that in particular areas, that's our ministry. Um, right. so I think that many times we get this thing mixed up in churches that the church, one physical church, I'm going to use Brother Life as an example, is that we're supposed to have uh, this well or machine in all of these areas to make sure that um, everything is taken care of. I believe that our role as brother of life is, is to serve those who are hurt and rejected. And during this COVID-19 pandemic, I still been attending to them. So basically I just do what I do 
and and that's the best that I can do as far personally. I agree with you. I think it, I, I think that's well said. I think obviously the gospel message is it will always be needed. There's nothing more valuable, but I think that there is, like you said, because we weren't doing it initially, because the focus wasn't on community, it was on, on brand, it was on you know the 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 mega conferences and whatnot. When pandemic hits, you can't pivot, right? Like if you exactly. weren't doing that before, you're not gonna do it now, right? right. So, so I, I totally agree, uh, totally understand. Uh, my my issue is when you're talking about bridging the gap, and I know you got to go. You're a busy man. You got to revive in the night. Uh, I'm I'm here. Let's talk. All right. I, I when you're talking about bridging the gap, and there is what I will call faith without commitment, and what I mean by that. You have a lot of people that I really feel love God, but church and that, and what I mean by like the organization and that just don't seem to add up, right? And especially probably within the millennial generation more than ever. What is the message, right? Like when you look at the Ahmaud Aubrey's of the world, you look at the incident that just happened in Minnesota, uh, you're looking at 36 shootings, Memorial Day weekend in Chicago, nine deaths overall. What role is the church playing in any of this chaos, right? Because obviously the days of Martin Luther King are gone. We don't have that leader, that one face. So what do you do now? So my question to you is, as the church, as you say, right? how can we present a united platform without a leader? I, I don't think you can. I think you have to unite. And it doesn't have to be like one single face. It doesn't have, right. to, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. But right. I think without unity, you can't do that. But you have to at least agree on vision. And my problem is, is that I don't see it. I'm not speaking anything particular. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not shooting shots, right? Yeah, I get it. But if it's not there, if there was, like you said before, if there wasn't an initial focus and we don't have an answer, right? We don't have a strategic plan in place. Prophecy is um, t- prophecy is only desirable to those who want it. Amen. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you could prophesy to be whatever, whatever, but if I feel like within my own merit, I can achieve the same thing, it can fall on deaf ears. Correct. So I just hope, My focus is, from what I'm seeing, I hope the church can not shift away from mysticism, but I think we're so on the edge. Everything has to be in the spirit, by the spirit, of the spirit, through the spirit, and we still human, and when we do all this spirit, it doesn't add up, and I feel like God is a God of balance, right? Absolutely. Right? So that's that's just kind of my take on it. And and I I I totally agree with that, but I, I would like to say this is that in this season, as a leader, I'm going to be transparent. Okay. If you're not building a brand, you're going to be lost. That's true. You're going to be lost. And the Bible lets us know first is natural and then is spiritual. In corporate America, you have the name of the company. Right. In the company, it might be 17 different branches, 17 different departments that all work together to make the company. I believe that we as churches, some of us are only in human resources business and we don't have nobody that's doing the frontline work that we want to be the ones that report. No, that's right. And that's wrong. But we don't have nobody that's out here. And I will tell you this, and Cody, I do agree with you with this. The church does not take chances. No. We're safe. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Like our decisions have to be safe. Like you think they're going to like this? You think we're going to be all right? So because of that's our mentality, we're not pushing the edge of change. So I totally agree, especially in the community. We're not doing anything to change community. We're just giving out turkeys. That's it. We need no brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> need no brown. Cash money millionaires, man. Yes. But yeah, that's it's sad. It's sad yeah. but true. And and I'll let you go. Uh, I just want to hit you with a couple more. Please, I you hit you. on brand. You hit on brand, and you're right. People follow brands. I'm an I'm an Adidas guy, but I love Nikes. You know what I'm saying? Like, and unfortunately, as a as a preacher, as a pastor, as a whatever, 
you have to have a brand if anybody's going to follow you. You have to have some type of market appeal that's commercial. That's just, it's an unwritten rule. It's not fair, but it is what it is. With brand development, is there ever a time where the brand spokesperson is with their team and says, hey, are we more brand than we are power? You know? Woo. Like, Woo. like. Are we and one brand that nobody wants to buy this in Walmart? It is in there, you know. Or are we a brand like not to pick on Jordan, but are we the $250 shoes that folks are going broke over? You know, so which brand are we? You know, and which brand do we need to be? Okay. Um Jesus himself had a brand. Right. Okay. The thing with Jesus brand, the reason why people followed him wasn't just because of this amazing word. Right. They followed him literally because he was performing miracles. So when he left the pool of Bethesda and he ended up in the desert and it was 5,000 people, 30,000 people, whatever. It was because he was performing miracles and that was his brand. What the church is doing now is we're promoting miracles, but there are no miracles that are being performed. Right. So in that, our flyers are better than our services. I totally agree with you with that. But I, I, I will tell you this, is that in the structure of the church, what mm -hmm. we're trying to do is catch up. So you see it every Sunday, Cody, on, on, on um, social media. Churches on Sunday, we are on there like this is our time, right? Yeah. We visit 15 churches in two hours. True. And I will tell you this personally, I've learned more as a pastor in this two months of the pandemic than I have learned in five years of pastor. Wow. By far. Mm -hmm. so for me, I get I got a chance to see, OK, what a church is and how we can develop those that are coming in and those that are yet to come in for me. All right, all right. That's fair. I, I admit I, I like the humility and transparency. And the last oh, two yeah. months, the last four years, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. All right, last we're gonna play one game. Word association. I'm gonna throw some names. First thing that comes to your mind. Are you sure? Fit. Yeah, I'm sure. Word association. All right. First one, Penny Hardaway. Awesome. LeBron James. All right. Paul Pierce. Overrated. Corey Benjamin. A bus. Hey, Elton Brand. Overrated. Woo. Mike Miller. Shooter. Tracy McGrady. Top 12. Will Chamberlain. Underrated. Shaq. Dominant. Harold Miner. A boom. A boom. <laughs> I'm sorry. Boom. Tim Hardaway. Legend. All right. And my last one, just for you, just because you're my first guest, Kobe Bryant. And now, here we go. Huh? <laughs> you know I'm going to go out there and preach, right? I know. Okay. I Thank you. I have more words. Kobe Bryant, for me, is the most skilled basketball player of all time. And I believe because he followed Michael Jordan, I believe that he's discredited. But Cody, Cody, what you don't remember is, is that there were two factors in, 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 in Kobe's life. Number one, the commercial, I want to be like Mike. I remember. And another one that the church was saying, what would Jesus do? That meant that if you was in a situation, you want to be like Jesus because he's the, he's the epitome of decisions. So Kobe made up in his mind that I got the same body as Michael Jordan. Same. That's who I'm going to go after. I believe if Kobe would have had a body like LeBron James, then we wouldn't be saying that he's trying to be like Mike. He just so happened to be similar sizes. And that's my one word about Kobe Bryant. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Look, respect. Rest in peace, Kobe. You know, I love Kobe. Um, he was always in my top five. I, I was never an MJ fan. FYI. I loved MJ, just never a fan. Uh, I mean, as far as whatever, I liked Penny, I liked AI, I liked T Mac, I love Kobe, 
And when LeBron came into the league, it was a wrap for me, you know. So, uh, but that's that's it. Well, look, I appreciate you. Where oh, can, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yeah, you can ask me a question. What do you feel that the church can do better? What do you feel? Give a give me. Uh, give me. I hear a lot I'm about what the church should do, but I never hear solutions from people who are asking me about the church. I just hear questions. I think the first solution is is uh, this you have to have a strategy. And what I mean by that, I think the church is equipped with the greatest generations, uh, greatest generation of preachers when it comes to expositors, people who can really proclaim the gospel, people who are talented, singers, psalmists, musicians, prophetess, prophets, you name it, we have it. It doesn't matter what denomination, this is the greatest to me generation of just gifts in the body of Christ. The problem with gifts is that ability does not mean strategy. And anybody that is in an organization, anybody that's ever accomplished any great feat, any financial obstacle, you cannot do it through talent alone. You have to do it through strategy. And when you are strategic, and I mean by that, that means just because you are the greatest preacher among the brethren doesn't necessarily mean you should be pastor or bishop. It doesn't even qualify you. Jesus said, if you wanted to be the greatest or the chief among ministers, you know, you'll be the servant, right? So it doesn't even, it doesn't qualify you. How do we even evaluate that? What plan do you have, right? And we hate to say that because we all want our leaders, our spiritual leaders to be dynamic like T.D. Jakes, to be studied like Noel Jones, to be conscious, black conscious like Jamal Bryant, right? But they don't have to be. And that's just the reality of it. So you first have to have a strategic body that understands we have to push the mission of the gospel and the organization to affect community further. How do we go about doing that? Then you have to take an assessment of the talent around you. The other thing is, my mama would say like this, never put a fat person in the kitchen. And what she meant by that is that we have a lot of people who, I always say this, great leaders have another life. And what I mean by that, usually they have done something else. They have made some type of sports teams. There's a human side to them that is essential and that they have worked on and they can carry those same traits over here. When you're so dominant over here in the ecclesiastical world, the problem with all that is that you lose sight of what is tangible, right? Like, like I can't make every church meeting and pay right. rent. Yes, sir. Right, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, because they're not giving me the offer, you know. So there, there has to be strategic uh initiatives, there has to be an assessment of the body of the talent that's around you and who can do what, when, and how. And I think the third thing is that the church has to apologize. And what I mean by apologize, it doesn't matter if it's the white church, if it's the black church, because we are human, we are flawed, and these flaws have happened. It's just like if you watch the Clark Sisters movie, it made I almost said their names. I got to see you watch it. It made a couple of them look real bad. <laughs> it made our presidium, our general board, look judgmental. And it was. And then when I watched the Clark sisters on the Terrell show, they plain out said, no apology has ever been made. The problem is we don't ask for forgiveness. And we think over time it just healed. No, look, this happened. It was wrong. You know, it is what it is. How do we move forward from that? Right. And until we own up to the, the problems that we create, we're just going to keep going in a circle, keep having conferences. And I'm not saying they're not effective. I'm not saying that people won't get saved. I'm not saying that people won't get blessed. But when you are trying to make it out in the world, and let's say you don't come from that upbringing, right? Nobody, you weren't, you're not the third or fourth generation. You know, you're not a bishop's grandson. You really right. have no... Um, genealogical attachment to this thing, you're going to be like, why? It doesn't make sense, you know, right. and it doesn't make sense. And we have to, we have to admit that church right. doesn't make sense. A lot right. of this stuff doesn't. Right. And until we accept those three things and literally that three, there will be no solution. You know, because if you have all this gift, all this anointing, and you can't tackle these three issues, you will literally have what I would call a uh, systematic need. So the only time they will come to you, the only time they'll partner with you is when the need is pressing. If they're dying of cancer, if they're on the deathbed, if something is so urgent that they can't exercise any other human, you know, uh, functionality to get past. And then the church becomes all of a sudden essential. Just like everybody now want to pray because of COVID, you know, 
<laughs> you know, like, but when COVID lifts, and let's say the economy gets back to where it was, it are, are is you know are the preachers going to have the same access to MSNBC? No, you know. No, so not at all. we we have to uh, just address those three things. We have hurt people. We haven't put the right people in place because we prefer loyalty over ability. And the third thing is our just desire to be seen and the abilities that we have has created such an ego within the church that we become ineffective. You know, so these three things get tackled. I'll show up. No, I'm just like, I'm not showing up. You know what I'm saying? No, I want to say thank you because I always, I try my best as a leader to listen. I've learned that listening can bless you. And yeah. uh, I want to say thank you. Um, you, rep you represent your generation um, extremely well. And I honor you. And I'm honored to be um, on the show. Thank you for choosing me to talk um, to me about a multiple uh, thing. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to have a str strategical meeting right now before the revival. Um, so I just want to tell you thank you um, for allowing me to, um, to be on the show. Uh, anytime. I appreciate you being my guest, you know, because you don't have to. I know you're a busy person. I know you have more Instagram followers than I do. Uh, sadly, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know why I did my Instagram. I'm going to start posing I'm, naked. No, I'm, I'm, honey, I'm not even a grammar. The, the, my youth department told me to. Look, I'm being honest with you. I'll be trying to ask people to just follow me. They'd be like, why? I'd be like, nah, we grew up together. What you mean? You know? Right. <laughs> my, my youth department told me, you got, you got, you ain't posted a picture in, in a month. I'll be like, why? What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. We will connect. Yes, Where can they connect with you? What are you doing? Where can they connect with you? Uh, you can meet me on the uh, Naaman Williams, uh, my name is Naaman Williams website. That's NaamanWilliams.com. Um, you can meet me there. Um, you can meet us on the Bread of Life page. Um, I'll be in Revival on tonight. And, of course, you can meet me on my Facebook page. And uh, I'd love to see y'all, man. Come holler at your boy. All right. Well, until next time, thanks, you guys. Appreciate it, Eamon. Yes, sir. All right.